Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, it's extremely humbling uh, to be following Prime Minister Jogo um, after this uh, journey that she, she's taken uh, all of us on. Uh, you know, journey of 20 years uh, of uh, Mozambique rising from the ashes, really, uh, of, the, uh, of the civil war. Um, and what I would like to do uh, in the 10 minutes or so that I, that I have is to maybe try and give uh, a perspective on uh, what Prime Minister Jogo ju just said that would look at some of the uh, discussions we had this morning um, uh, and that would try to go beyond the, 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 the swing of the pendulum uh, that I've observed. Um, and what do I mean by this? Okay, so 10, 15 years ago, um, you would hear about best practices, about MTEFs, about program budgeting, about accrual accounting, etc. Some of these iconic things that governments around the world should be doing. And we're now saying, well, actually, you know, um, instead of best practices, we should think so. We should think of basics first, right? We should think of basic capabilities of the of the PFM system. Instead of MTEF, we should be thinking about Treasury single account, right? Instead of Accrual accounting, maybe uh, you know some decent cash accounting wouldn't be, wouldn't be bad, and instead of PPBB or uh, program uh, uh, or performance-based uh, budgeting, we should have basic controls over inputs. Well, if we're just replacing one orthodoxy by the next, I'm not sure that we'll get to that situation that we, we said Yoga was talking about of internally driven, externally supported reforms. I think what we'll have is a different set of externally driven reforms, mm. and I don't think that's where we want to go. And I'll try to use the, the, the experience of Mozambique to show how uh, we could find a bit of a third way between these two alternatives in, in terms of the dilemma that, uh, uh, that Ed Hedger was uh, referring to earlier. So let's start with the basics. I mean, Mozambique's PFM reform story is a success story, right? There's no two ways about it. If you look at the PFA indicators from you know, the first PFA that, Andrew, you were involved in and the second one, if you, look, if you compare Mozambique with the league table, as it were, of uh, African countries in terms of PFM performance, as uh, 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 Matt Andrews did in the paper that uh, Antoinette was referring to this morning, clearly Mozambique has gone from the bottom league to the top league and in a period of 10 years. That, that's an incredible journey. And if you look at the major achievements that underpin this, you know, you're, you're talking about aggregate fiscal discipline being, being, being good. You're talking about the stock and monitoring of arrears going drastically down, the monitoring going drastically up, the reliability, the timeliness of budget reports going up, cash management is now centralized, cash availability for budget holders is there, and transparency of tax obligations. These are just illustrations of some of the good things that have happened with, by the way, a very significant emphasis on the law, right? On a new, on a new legal framework called Sistafe and a new IT system called eSistafe to ingredients of traditional PFM approach, which have yielded some very good results. Now, second point. It's a success story, but like any success story, it has gaps. It has gaps. So when you look at how well the system is performing in terms of the functions that you would be looking for, you will see that there are difficulties. And when we came in, I started working in Mozambique in 2007, and then in 2008, 9 I started working with uh, Matt Andrews, and then Neil also uh, came on board to talk about um, program budgeting, because the government wanted us to, to help them with program budgeting. But at the same time, as they wanted us to talk about program budgeting, we were in that dilemma that Ed was talking about, we, because we were sensing that there were gaps in the reform. So let's start with service delivery. The headlines of the newspapers while we were in town would uh, indicate things like Minister of Health under pressure because pharmaceuticals are not available in health centers. Okay? The money is there. As Wiesa said, you know, the money has been allocated. It's, being, it's going to the line ministry. Ministry of Health has, has it, has the cash. And yet the pharmaceuticals are not there in the health centers. The patients are not receiving them. What's going on there? Education. Yes, we've built new schools. But are the teachers of the appropriate quality? Are they present in class? The schools have got about $20 million a year in um, school-based funds that are provided by partners. Is that being used appropriately for, to improve the quality of education? And the answer to those questions was no, not really. You know, there, are there are gaps there. So that's on service delivery. Let's look at allocation of resources. Yes, there was an MTEF. 
medium term expenditure framework. But then you had this game whereby planning, because after uh, Luis's time, the planning and finance were divided. So planning would do the MTEF, finance didn't like it and they didn't say anything. But then when it came to implementation, they actually <laughs> in, uh, executed the budget completely differently from what planning had intended. Secondly, donor funds, which uh, represent about 40% of the budget, were not well incorporated in the MTEF. So what's the meaning of that? And thirdly, you have all these mega projects that are happening in a way outside the MTEF and the budget framework, you know, by direct agreement between the president or the minister of planning and, you know, public-private partnerships and, 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 and partners, you know, particularly in the mining sector, etc., in connection with the natural resources. So that's really throwing the whole thing out of kilter as well. So that's on the strategic allocation of resources. Even on aggregate fiscal discipline, when we looked at the way in which the wonderful IT system w worked in practice, the government and ourselves came to the realization that you know, the, the, the classic process whereby you would commit funds in the system and then you know, you the, the, the services would be rendered, you'd get the invoice and then you'd pay, was, was actually being circumvented. And you were get, uh, getting some commitments made outside the system and then you know, the, the, uh, the invoice would come and then you'd enter everything into the system to, make, to, to get the payment through, through the system. So these are illustrations of some of the gaps on aggregate fiscal discipline. There was a something else on, on, on state of enterprises and contingent liabilities related to it. You know, things that are happening outside of the better structured budget systems. Yes, the budget systems improve, but of course, it's again the tip of the iceberg, right? There, there are things going on outside uh, of, the, of, the, of the formal budget process that, that can have an impact on the aggregate fiscal risk, as we know well from situations in, in, in Greece and other places in, in Europe. So what do we do with that? The third element of, of, of the discussion is to look at, OK, how do you move forward? How do you help governments take stock of what these gaps are, even in a successful environment like Mozambique? What are these gaps between the ideal, what it is you're trying to do, what the impact you want to have on the population, and what are you actually delivering? And what we found out is that there are ways to make this gap objective. And that helps a lot in the conversation. Right? So the first way is to look at the PIFA da data in more detail. And the PIFA has many dimensions to it. Some of it is more focused on processes uh, and some things that are central. But other aspects of the PIFA are focused on performance. And so you can highlight the difference between these two dimensions or sub-dimensions in the <coughs> PIFA framework to show people around the table, look, you have an issue here in terms of how behaviors are changing or not changing. The second thing you can sh do is use the latent knowledge of these rising stars that uh, Luisa was talking about, which I can witness uh, actually uh, existed and, and, and did a, uh, brought out a massive change in the way in which the Ministry of Finance operates. These people have a lot of embedded knowledge about where it is that the system is working and is not working, including the provincial directors, <laughs> the district directors. So what we did is we brought all of them into one room and we asked them to rate various dimensions of the PFM system at the national, provincial and district level. Interestingly, they all agreed that it was much worse when you went from national to provincial, provincial to district, that it was much better in upstream than in downstream, except that you know, the district people had even worse idea of how bad the district was than the provincial and the, <laughs> and the national people did. So when we showed the data back to them, they had an objective uh, idea of, of, of what those gaps were in the system, and that helped them inform how their PFM reform strategy should be, should be uh, put together moving forward. Uh, a, a third element is to bring data on some of the uh, uh, problems that line ministries face. Let's take the issue of health. You know, one thing that we were able to do is put around the table people from finance, from health, and from planning, as well as donors, to look at this issue of expired drugs in health centers or, or missing pharmaceuticals in health centers. What is it that's going on? Let's look at the positive deviations. What are those places where actually there is availability? Why, why is, that, is it happening there? And then to go back from there to, well, what can we do to make sure that it happens all the way around? So from a, an initial conversation about we want to do program budgeting because it looks good, we went to a discussion about, okay, what are some of the problems that program budgeting might solve, i.e., you know, absentee teachers or uh, pharmaceuticals that are not available in health centers, to what is it that we can do collectively, right, with the right people around the table to, to help address these functional problems? And that's how we came to design the, the public financial management for results operation that, uh, uh, that, that 
you know, we, we, we did with the, with the authorities. And, the, you know, what's very interesting in that process is that it, it took time. It took time to identify the problem. It took time to identify who are the right people to, to put in the, in the room. Like uh, uh, Luisa was saying, maybe it's not the people at the highest level. Maybe it's the people at the level be below that. Um, but at the end of the day, it shows that there is a third way between you know, just saying, OK, program-based budgeting is not for you because you, know, you haven't fixed all your issues yet. But who has? You know? The USA hasn't fixed all their issues. France hasn't fixed all its issues. And yet it's moved to program-based budgeting in 2001. Um, so between on the one hand saying you're not ready, and on the other hand saying you can go ahead, you know, full steam, you, know, you can do New Zealand in Sierra Leone. Um, I think there's a third way. The third way is to go back to what it is that you're trying to fix, as Neil was saying. What's the problem that, is actually, that actually matters to people who are beneficiaries of the PFM system? And then to work your way up from there, what are some of the obstacles to solving that problem? Let me stop here. Okay. Thank you very much, Renaud. Uh, very provocative. And I very much like the idea of um, using program budgeting as a sort of label for a range of reforms mm whilst actually focusing on problems in the short term. I think that's very interesting. Well, let us open out to the audience. I'm sure you all have many questions uh, uh, to pose. 